Well, thank God it is Friday, and thank God that uh, I am joined once again by Tim Miller. I was telling my wife, Tim, just a few minutes ago, I am so glad that I have Tim on the podcast today <laughs> because there's so much going on, and and I think that you and I are probably, you know, in the same lane on our reaction to the debate slash the mugshot. I mean, we have to start with the mugshot, okay? Oh, so satisfying. <laughs> Talk to me about it. Talk to me about it. It's just so satisfying. The presidential portrait. The first presidential portrait of its kind. It's been a long time coming. You know, it really has. Um, I mean, for us eight years now. and uh, But really, even before that, uh, you know, he's been a criminal for a long time. The people he screwed over at Trump University, people he screwed <laughs> over other places. He's been a con man and yeah. a criminal his whole life. And we knew it. We said it. And, um, you know, it's been kind of this one long, slow rolling, unsatisfying, I told you so. <laughs> like, I was hoping you were going to say it first. <laughs> Just, <laughs> if only they had been warned. What did you tweet out? You know, never Trump from the jump. From okay. the jump. Okay. Guys, we told you this eight years ago. And that was my thought this morning. I'm, I'm looking at the mugshot and, you know, and I say, you know, what a twisted, bizarre, tangled road this has been. I mean, there's been so many chapters, you know, so many clowns and cowards and co-conspirators, but it all comes back to, to Donald Trump. And it was always going to end this way, wasn't it? I mean, you elect someone like that, yes. you know, a wannabe mob boss, you know, a serial fraudster, liar, and, you know, hey, shock that it ends this way. Yeah. I mean, anybody that knew anything about Donald Trump would have anything. known that it would have would have ended somewhere like this. I mean, did we know we were going to get 91 felony counts and the storming of the Capitol? Uh, you know, no, uh, the particulars. But no, I, you knew it was going to end in, in a fucking flaming dumpster fire of disaster. And here we are. And it's just so, you know, there's a lot of, you know, what are the impacts and what, you know, there's a lot of other ins and outs and what have you. But it's like, this is just an absolute unmitigated disaster for the Republican Party that is going to have ripple effects forever, right? I mean, like this stuff is like his, his mugshot is never going to go away. These guys' complicity yeah. is never going to go away. The whole never. parade yeah. of mugshots. I mean, I was enjoying everyone. I was the, the Trump one. I was worried it was going to be a little disappointment, but Rudy and any yeah. of his chief yeah. of staff and, you know, that people were bringing back the old pictures of Haldeman's mugshot from, you know, and, and, and flashing back the Meadows Haldeman comparison, which was satisfying. And, and Jen Ellis and Sidney Powell, I'm still waiting for Jeff Clark's, but it was needed, but you know, I guess the only one thing that cuts the other way for me on this is like, we do kind of feel like we're at the point now where everyone that's going to jump off the ship has jumped. You know, usually on, on each of these inflection points, there's been an exit ramp that like far too yeah. few people have taken, but a couple have taken. But there, nobody's taking any exit ramps mm. yesterday. Nobody's saying, you know, none of you mean, you mean the politicians, the political class types and everything. Yeah. Yeah. You know, let's come yeah. back to this a little bit later because, you know, there are okay. some there are some polls out there suggesting that, uh, you know, despite our default setting of nothing matters and he could shoot somebody in all of that stuff that he could set, you know, live monkeys <laughs> afire. In. Yeah, no, I'm not saying, I'm not talking about that. Yeah. You know, I mean, let's talk about the political. Oh, oh, okay, right. So, but, you know, and of course, there's all these, you know, the the whining about the weaponization of the Justice Department. And the point that I made in, in Morning Shots this morning is, you know, if you know Donald Trump, this was always coming, but also, this is a result of his choices. This is what he wanted. I mean, th there, there's an alternative reality. I mean, he chose to lie about the election. I mean, he could have behaved like every other president in U.S. history and conceded and allowed the peaceful transfer of power. Instead, he chose to orchestrate a coup. And, you know, he, he chose to defame election workers and he chose to try to intimidate officials into stealing votes. It was his choice to form a criminal enterprise, right? And conspire to defraud the government. It was his choice to summon the mob. I mean, all of these things. It was his choice to steal the classified documents and then ignore the subpoena. It, you know, it was his choice to, you know, try to, you know, erase the tapes and all of this. And frankly, and I guess this is like, you know, Tim, I'm sorry we've had this conversation. To your point, this is also the Republican Party's choice because they had so many opportunities to say no. They could have impeached and disqualified him. Yeah. And I have to say that what an amazing moment at that debate when they were all asked, the, you know, the candidates for president of the United States were all asked for the show of hands, whether they would support Trump, even if he was a convicted felon. And then six of them raised their hands. Yeah. Two of them sort of 
you know, awkwardly that that moment, you know, Ron DeSantis <laughs> looking around like, what is everybody else saying? Maybe you ending up being the only thing that ends up being memorable from that debate. I, we've talked about the debate more, but DeSantis' <laughs> yeah. slow hand raise uh, feels like might be oh, the thing that has legs out of all that. On the weaponization, really quick before we get to that, though, I just I, I know yeah, our listeners sure. know this. It is important to say it. Just how preposterous it is. And if anything, Merrick Garland was too timid, as you've covered quite, oh, absolutely. Yeah, quite extensively. Yeah. Slow. Like Mike Pence doesn't have any mugshots. He hasn't been arraigned. He hasn't been indicted. Bill Barr hasn't been indicted. Ron DeSantis, nobody's coming for him for, you know, the firing of prosecutors or anything like this. Like this whole like the whole preposterous notion that these guys are coming after Trump because they're whatever scared of him or whatever. It's like, it's ridiculous. I mean, most of these Democrats, frankly, are, are so stupid. They want to run against Trump and risk burning our entire society down um, with it. So oh there is no, nothing to that. And the fact that otherwise smart people, otherwise Ivy league educated people like Ted Cruz, like continue to advance this just shows like the depth of the rot on this side. And I think that is what connects for me the two things you brought up there. Just yeah. you have a Republican Party primary field where we're going to give Chris Christie three and, and Ace Hodgson one percentage point where 96% of the vote share is with people who said that they would vote for a convicted convict where you know the <laughs> vast, vast majority of Republican elected officials are advancing the obvious lie, you know, that this is some politicized like indictment. So somebody asked me, you know, if you were producer for Saturday Night Live, what would you do with with that debate, you know, with the slow hand raise of, you know, Ron DeSantis looking around? The thought that comes to my mind is that, and, you know, this is the problem of parodies these days, is that Brett Baer then actually asks a follow-up question. Well, okay, let's have a show of hands. How many of you would still vote for Donald Trump if he set baby monkeys afire uh, in the middle of Fifth Avenue. <laughs> All the hands would go up. How many of you would vote for Donald Trump for president if he beat baby whales to death with the bodies of baby seals? And it would just keep you know escalating. And of course, all the hands. And you can picture on everyone Vivek <laughs> getting more and more excited, raising his hand more fervently as like DeSantis looks around and being like, "Really, we're doing it again? We're doing it again? Okay, I guess I'll raise my hand again." Okay, I did. I just want to just stop for a moment because. Say every once in a while, you, you need to underline things. You know how extraordinary it is for the party of law and order. Because five minutes ago, Tim, it would have been the easiest question in the world because nobody would ever think of voting for a candidate who had been indicted, tried, and then convicted of felonies, found guilty of felonies by a jury of their peers. Nobody would have thought of endorsing or supporting that person, not for city council, the legislature, secretary of state. I mean, much less the presidency of the United States. I mean, this is like mind boggling. If you just wanted just one moment that captures what has happened to the Republican Party, I mean, on one level, you know, the extent to which they're still in the thrall of, of Donald Trump, but also just the incredible intellectual and moral corruption that they're all up there on stage saying, yeah, convicted felon, actual criminal. Yeah, we're okay with that. I mean, can you imagine this in, in 2005? Uh, yeah, I was thinking about this reading your newsletter. And just think about the confirmation process, right? Like any confirmation, any official that gets appointed to the federal government needs to be confirmed. Take out all the coup stuff. Take out all the coup stuff. <laughs> just the documents case. Somebody that was indicted for this level of mishandling of documents would not get approved by the Senate for any office. Like there's nothing that they would approve this person. Deputy Secretary of Commerce. Or hired by any public company. You show up again to apply for the shift manager at Arby's <laughs> with this rap sheet. <laughs> You're not going to get the job. And it's just like, it is crazy. And, and the moral bankruptcy is part of it, but all, and then also just the self preservation element. Like the thing that just was astonishing to me on that stage on Wednesday was I guess Nikki Haley kind of made the practical argument about how Donald Trump was the most unpopular politician in America. Yeah, but but nobody was like, guys, guys. We might love him, but have you seen his court date calendar <laughs> next year? <laughs> like, are we really going to nominate somebody who's who's got to be sitting behind a table for a vast part? Chris Christie kind of flirted with mm -hmm. that, yeah. But no, no, you're right. You're right. It's like people, like, have we lost our minds? Do you know what we're about to do here? Okay, there's a lot of heavy stuff here, and I, I want to get to the debate. I want to get to Vivek and all of that stuff. And But a couple of things. 
Number one, Donald Trump's weight. Donald Trump <laughs> self-reports his weight. He, he says he's six foot three and 215 pounds. I mean, for fuck's sake, Tim. <laughs> yeah. I was, uh, uh, he could be Mac Jones, quarterback of the New England Patriots. Um, you know, I saw that his basketball comp was this guy, Lou Dort, who's like the most muscled man in all of the, whole, <laughs> yeah. all of the NBA, who plays for the Thunder. So that's not true. I, I'm just going with the fact that it's a typo and that it was 315. But, yeah. Um, you know, you'd think I mean, that, he's got to be 290, right? At, at minimum. You'd think that the Fulton County Court wow, would have just been like, guy. You know, you at on. least give us okay. give us this something in the give document. us something in the ballpark here. I mean, yeah, this is actually a, an official document. <laughs> yeah, I was disappointed in that, but I'm not gonna I'm not gonna let myself get too disappointed because the lie is so obvious. Okay. The more intriguing thing was that he he volunteered his hair as as strawberry blonde. When it's more of like a burnt sienna for me, um, I, I mean, but maybe just it's just because his orange that. scalp is like you can see his scalp yeah, going through. But a straw—he's not really a strawberry blonde, I wouldn't say. Uh, it's kind of that was kind of an effeminate choice, even strawberry blonde. Okay, what was with the motorcade? <laughs> I mean, you asked this really excellent question. What is the possible security rationale for eighty motorcycles flanking a loser who is being arraigned? I mean, this actually pisses me off. Well, and also the media doing that. They cannot freaking help themselves. They have to do the whole OJ slow moving Bronco stuff. But what was with that motorcade? I mean, I don't know that there were 80 motorcycles, but it was intense. There were so many motorcycles. And then, and then it was yeah. in the in the New Jersey side and the Georgia side. You know, one of the one of the guys that replied to my tweet, uh, you know, on there was like it was like the when the king of Zamunda comes to America and coming to America. You know, you would think that this was a G20 or, you know, the the Queen of England going to visit her, you know, an imperial capital. Like I don't legitimately I don't understand the security rationale. I mean, like, do you think that there's gonna be like an armed Antifa <laughs> confab that comes after him. I mean, how many people could you possibly need to protect the president? But it seems more dangerous, right? Like if you're worried about a bomb threat or something, stochastic terrorism, everyone being able to watch this slow moving motorcade, you know, parading through Newark and then parading through Atlanta. It seems like a bigger threat uh, to me. I'm not a security expert, but it seems like a low profile. And George Conway, you pointed out, tweeted, you know, there was a video of Obama going to something that he that he picked up yeah. at yeah. post presidency. And it's it's two. Yeah, it's two SUVs and one police car. No sirens, no two, nothing. Right. I and mean, that seems like no light, uh, that, that seems just from a security point more appropriate. But then just from the optics like this thing, this pisses me off. Right? Like, he's not he has no office. Right. He's a former president. So, you know, we, he has to, Secret Service. We get that. But in America, just to start with, you know, we don't have royal kings and queens, right? Like we have citizen leaders and they should be treated as such. Um, and it's a long time rant of mine. Like, I just think I think that politicians should sit at stoplights. Like, I, I don't I don't understand why anybody, <laughs> maybe the president yeah, for security why? reasons, yeah. but why anybody else gets a motorcade that, that doesn't sit at stoplights. We have citizen leaders in this country. We do not have royalty. And just the visual of this guy going to get arrested you know, with that kind of pomp and circumstance, it fucking pisses me off. I, and then there's the taxpayer element of it. I just, I don't like it. And I I, re- I don't know the real answer because he had the same treatment in New Jersey and in Atlanta. So is it the local police? Is it the Secret Service guys doing him a solid? I genuinely don't get it. I think it's a legitimate question. I mean, this whole thing, like, no one is above the law. You will be treated like anybody else. Uh, no. I mean, I mean, look, I understand that there are security concerns. But sure. this was, this was essentially... You know, a taxpayer funded parade. And we know that Donald Trump really, really likes parades, yeah. doesn't he? OK, so let's talk about the debate. I think you and I may have a slightly different uh, take on all of this. I mean, okay, that, good. What, what, how do you think Fox handled it? I mean, I, I thought, you know, this was supposed to be the redemption. I thought Joe Perdicone had a great n- newsletter. This was this was a reminder that Fox News is still Fox News. And I, I thought it was kind of a shit show. What did you think? Just about the way the moderators handled it. The fact that they went a full hour without even mentioning the orange elephant not in the room. I mean, come on. Questions about country western songs and UFOs. Yeah, the three-minute propaganda thing at the beginning was very strange. <laughs> like like eight people walk out on stage, and then there's like a two-minute sizzle reel about how Joe Biden's the worst president in American history. Mm-hmm. And then they, they play the preponderance of the Richmond, North of Richmond song for everyone to yeah. sit there and listen to. Like while all eight 
of them just stand there. I don't know. There was something communist about that. Like, I just, I, I don't know. It was very strange. <laughs> I thought the most telling thing about Fox's treatment of Trump is like the crowd is booing. And at one point, you know, Brett has to turn around and calm everybody down. And he's like, you know, I know we all want to move on from this. I know we all want to get on to other things. And it's like, do we though? He has about half of the primary electorate right now. There's this whole like farce that gets perpetuated in in the you know, polite society, conservative media world where it's like, you know, it's just those deranged never Trumpers and the, and the New York Times that are just an MSNBC that's obsessed with Trump. And we want to talk about other things. We want to get on to serious matters like, you know, whether kindergartners are ready to read about the Stonewall riots and, you know, vape pens. And it's like, I don't think that that's right, actually. It's Republican voters. I would love for Donald Trump to just go the fuck away. I'd love for him to fall into the sea and disappear forever. I'd, I'd love to never have to think about him again. Yeah. It's Republican voters that want him. And so they might not be happy that they have to talk about the, all the bad things that he did. And I'm, and I'm sorry for them that, you know, that they need their binky. But to not talk about the guy winning by 40 points <laughs> in the first hour is preposterous. And to weird. apologize yeah. for it to the crowd when you have to bring him up. And the whole thing's preposterous. I mean, it's especially because, I mean, Donald Trump's decision not, not to come is basically an FU to uh, Fox News. It's an FU to, uh, to the, the RNC and to Republican voters and to the other people on the stage. But, you know, this has been the pattern, right? That the response to being humiliated and slapped by Donald Trump is to say, thank you, sir, may I have another one? Yeah. Instead of pushing back on him. Just like nobody made the practical case against him about the arrest, like we were talking about him earlier, nobody tries to do the, this guy's a wuss. He's a wuss. He can't even come out here. Yeah. I was hoping that Christie would say, by the way, we are here, you know, doing this. You know, where is the coward who won't even face us? But whatever. Yeah, a little baby won't even come. Give him the empty podium treatment. I, you know what I mean? Like, do something. The thank you, sir, I, may I have another is exactly the vibe. All right. So this was the Vivek show. I think the one thing that united everybody on that stage, the, the one point of unity is they all um, loathe uh, Vivek. They think that he's a fraud, <laughs> that he's a fake, and they're all right about all of this. And yeah. and they're just they're just sick and tired of him. But the crowd seemed generally to like him. He's the one. He's got he got the buzz. Now again, we, we may disagree, but I thought they were kind of if there were two lanes, the MAGA lane and the normie, you know, donor lane, clearly Vivek won the MAGA lane. He speaks fluent MAGA. I mean, he he hit every single one of those buttons. I'm gonna argue later that I thought Nikki won the normie lane, but let's talk about Vivek because there's a guy who has been just, you know, throwing feces up against the wall for, you know, several weeks. You've seen him, you know, how entertaining he is. I mean, he is, he's gifted. He's a gifted and therefore even more dangerous demagogue. But he's out there talking about, you know, 9-11 being an inside job, January 6th being an inside job. He embraces every batshit crazy conspiracy theory about Ukraine policy, you know, more Trumpy than Trump on appeasement. Give Taiwan to the Chinese, you know, let Vladimir Putin win. I mean, what's the downside? Defund Israel. And yet, Tim, he is the new hotness. He is the new rock star for the MAGA right. Yeah. You feel like there's a trajectory line, right? I mean, since you've done Trump, should we be surprised that the next man up is not, say, Mike Pence, that the next man up is this, you know, shallow, Utterly shameless demagogue, Vivek Ramaswamy. Yeah. So just really quick on the merits of what he's saying. I, did you see the clip from after the debate where he's asked about Ukraine I and did. he's talking about how, you know, actually us cutting a deal with the Russians is the best thing for Ukraine because if we don't, then some warlord is going to take over from Zelensky and they're going to turn into Afghanistan. It's just like. He's a buffoon. That's just uh, rank idiocy and offensive. And the Pope Zelensky stuff, a total charlatan on this stuff. You know, and he's up there just machine gunning, like conspiracy nonsense. Like the one that caught my ear that I didn't see anybody else talk about was, he's like, uh, you know, one way to resolve our, our crime issue is we need to bring back insane asylums. Did you catch that? Oh, yeah. He's like, yeah, "Yeah." he's like, he's like, we've been shutting down our mental institutions. We got to bring those back. And it's like, okay, well, that's a hot take. You know, we we need more cops. We need qualified immunity for them so they don't get sued. And then we need to give them the right to lock people up in the loony bin. That's great. That's the freedom first agenda right there. But I think maybe he overstepped on some of that stuff. And I think that his personality is is more grating than Trump's. But just directionally, 
about what the people want in the party, and, and not everybody, but what a big portion of the party wants. On the Ukraine thing, the other hand raised question, when Brett Baer is like, should we stop sending money to Ukraine? Vivek shoots his hand up. I mean, it's coming out of his shoulder. Way socket. up. Yeah. I, I, yeah he's he, he didn't give a DeSantis sort of little alligator arm thing. He was up there like me, me. Yeah. Tiptoes, me. No one else on their stage raises their hand. Okay. In recent polls, 71% of Republicans are with Vivek. So yeah. this was a little reminiscent to me of Trump in 2016 when people are like, this guy's a clown. He's saying conspiracy stuff. And that was true. But there were also a handful of issues, immigration, Muslim ban, Iraq war, where he was the only one on a big stage saying something that people in the crowd agreed with. And so I'm not saying that everyone wow. should pander and change their view on Ukraine. I'm, I'm just saying that if, if we're in reality about where the party is, that that's good for Vivek if he's the only one on a 70% issue on the side of the 70. And then there's six people really on the side of the 30. And then Ron DeSantis does the alligator arms thing and kind of tries to do, well, you know, the Europeans should pay more. And, and so you know, he tries to tiptoe on both sides of that whole thing. So, you know, and then there's six on the side of, of we should give Ukraine more money, which is, you know, a, a decent chunk of the party, a quarter of the party, 30%. You could replicate that on some other issues too. You're right. That's a reality check that in fact, he knows, you know, where all the erogenous zones are for the right. Yeah. And he has flipped. I mean, he has, he has flipped like, like his criticisms of Trump in his book were like, oh, he is a baby like Stacey yeah. Abrams. And, and I, I didn't like the tariffs. And he's like, the spending was too high. And that was just in a book that he wrote like two years ago. And he's trashed all that. But he is he's learned from Trump. He's gotten on the road. He listens to what the people want. And now he's just like, oh, OK, well, I can adjust. I can just give these people un unfiltered Candace Owens. Like, that's easy. None of these people have any memories whatsoever. So did you see what your, what your old friend, Lee Stefanik, tweeted out today? Oh, no, I've missed that one. All in caps, Trump won. One what? Who the fuck? You know, I mean, here's somebody who, again, you know, has got this you know, great educational pedigree who was once considered a rising star among the, you know, thoughtful right. You work with her at the RNC. Her transformation has been, you know, to absolute, complete shameless shell. I'm just watching how many of these people have just completely shed everything that they used to be and believe, you know, starting with J.D. Vance and, and, and Lindsey Graham. It's like there's some weird drug out there that they have to go in the room and they get the juice or something. You know what I'm saying? It's just, you know, so Vivek in some ways is, well, of course it's going to lead to somebody like this. Oh yeah. And this is the other thing that just, and, and I want to get into Nikki next, but this is a related topic. And there were some things that I liked about the stage. I, in my, not my party this week, I talked about how Nikki was surprisingly good for me. And so, so was Pence. So there are things I didn't like both raised their hands and said they voted for a convicted convict, yeah. for example, but, but there were some things that I liked, which we can talk about. The thing that I, I get frustrated with is I saw a lot of, there was some conventional wisdom out there and particularly in the center right world that was like, there was some refreshing elements of this debate that this is what the party could look like under Trump. Like there's one weird MAGA guy, but there's a lot of relative normies up there. And then there's DeSantis kind of straddling. And it's like, well, wait, the stage was like that because Trump wasn't there. If Trump died, if Trump had a heart attack, maybe I'm wrong, but I don't think the field would be this field. Right. I think that there would be other people trying to fill that. Vivek would not be alone. There would be other people trying to fill the Trump lane because that's where the majority of the party is. I mean, Ben Shapiro did this tweet yesterday that was like, the party is 35% MAGA, 20% mm -hmm. MAGA adjacent, 25% Reagan, 20% never Trump. Yeah. And I'm like, I wish. If that was true, the stage would make sense, right? Because there's kind of a competitive, it's like 55, 45 MAGA traditional but like that's not what it is it's like 65 35 or 70 30 and so that is the thing that that i just think is is sobering and bill put this well i think on thursday night for bulk plus subscribers when he was like 75 percent of the party is going to be with the three worst candidates or 80 percent so like that is that's the concerning thing and i think that that like is some context about the vivek situation before we get to Nikki, um, who is the biggest loser on the, on the stage, did you think? Tim Scott, for sure. Okay, that's what I thought. Yeah. He was weird. He disappeared. and Totally. I mean, again, he proved what people know. I, my, my, my friend Peter Hamby writes for Puck. I just I wrote this article like a month ago. It was just like, I don't think that these donors that are giving Tim Scott money have met Tim Scott. Like, he's a nice Ooh. guy. He's fine. Uh, you know, obviously, he's way too lick spittle about Trump, yeah. but interpersonally, he's a nice guy, but like, he doesn't have these performing skills. Like this is a 
reverse tokenization effort to like put somebody up that that they could feel good about, but it's like, he just didn't have it up there. And so I just think that Larry Ellison just lit 60 million totally on fire for no reason. I'm also, also confused what Tim Scott's thing was. Remember when he said he agreed with Mike Pence? It's like, okay, so now you're not going to be VP. It's like, why are you running just because some rich guy gave you 60 million and you had nothing better to do? Just like the motorcade, I genuinely do not understand. If anyone is listening and knows why Tim Scott is running for president, please let me know. Because I assumed he was running for VP, but now he's never going to be VP. I had the same assumption. And of course, you know, if he was not running for VP, this was a great opportunity for him to be the, hey, give me a second look. I'm the non-Trump acceptable candidate. And he just faded away. I mean, he spoke for about eight minutes. By the way, I'm totally bored now talking about Ron DeSantis. The Ron DeSantis is really, really bad at this. Okay, have we done this? But I mean, clearly that was not the debate that he wanted or, or needed. And, you know, talk about a guy who is just not comfortable in his skin. So you're, you're a veteran of these debates. It was Ted Cruz for me. I don't need to go yeah, on. It yeah, was Ted Cruz again. I, I, now, remember, Ted Cruz finished second. And it was kind of a distant second. I but, do remember. Um, I, you know, he he hit his marks. He said that mostly the things the MAGA people like. You know, the awkward hand raise is going to be bad. He has weird facial expressions. He's a, kind of an awkward person, just like Ted Cruz is. And, and his likability factor is low. But he is minimally acceptable. For people in all these lanes, to the extent that you know you want to call them lanes, and so I, you know, I wouldn't be surprised if polls come out next week and he gained a point or two or something. You know what I mean? I, I, I I'm think- expecting that Vivek's going to overtake him, though. What What do you think? I mean, with the polls next week, who's in second place? Uh, I think that you'll see some for both of them. I put out a tweet that I was mm. like, I bet you'll see one poll that has Vivek in the high teens and DeSantis in the low teens. That's my priors. We'll see. Maybe that's wrong. Remember. DeSantis was in the 20s and has lost altitude. So, you know, can you win some of those people back? Sure. I think that Vivek gets some momentum for sure. Um, Nikki does. He needed to really regain alpha status, you know, and, and regain, oh, oh, right. This is why we liked him, you know, the migrant guy. And he didn't do that. Yeah, and no. he was fine. Uh, you know, the National Review people liked him, but they liked him already. Yeah. <laughs> Of course they did. I just thought that by the end of the debate, he felt like uh, an afterthought. Okay, so this brings me to Nikki. I actually was very, very surprised by her performance. I have to do admit that, I mean, I've been you know quite critical of her. I wrote a piece called The Unbearable Lightness of, of Nikki Haley. When I was like, you know, gaming out in my mind what I thought might happen at this debate, I wasn't even thinking about her. And she comes out right away with that statement about uh, spending of all things, you know, this high lob, you know, ripping fellow Republicans, you know, calling out Donald Trump for raising $8 trillion in in debt. And that was the moment I thought, okay, so um, she has decided that she's running for president, not for vice president, and she's going to call them out. I thought she was really strong on Ukraine going after Vivek. I thought Vivek dominated that stage until that moment. And I think if you listen to the crowd, there was a turn. Now, it doesn't change the fact that it was his dominant night, but feel free to disagree with me here. But I think a lot of that, that and maybe they're irrelevant. Maybe this doesn't make a difference. Maybe there is no donor class. Maybe there is no normie class at all. Maybe it is only 30%. But the folks who've been sitting around going, you know, we need somebody else because DeSantis is so awful. The people who are on the phone to Glenn Youngkin or hoping that uh, Brian Kemp gets into the race. On Thursday morning, didn't they wake up going, hey, we got to give this Nikki Haley a second look? Yeah. And that's why the real big winner of the debate was Nikki Haley's political consultants, because yeah. <laughs> they are now going to get to cash in on on some TV ads that they you didn't think, think so. that they were going to have the money for. And so I want to congratulate those guys and the new the new pool they're putting in in Bethany Beach. Um, <laughs> Uh, because they are no the real cynicism ones. here. Okay, here well, I'll be earnest for a second. It was refreshing to hear her about yeah. Ukraine to give just a in touch with reality position about abortion. Um, even if you don't agree with all the particulars, I, I thought that it was directionally good to have her, a woman up there, saying yeah. that and like offering like at least some kind of reality based position on on how to balance different contingencies on abortion, the spending thing. But I, again, yeah. let's just say, and I think that this could be possible, right? That she coalesces the Scott vote, the Christie vote, her own, 
you know, the, the little ones and twos of the aces and the, and the, and the will herd all together, maybe even takes one or two of the normie mm-hmm. national review types who are with DeSantis and they, and they pop over. Like what's their ceiling? 25 ceiling like ceiling ceiling 28 right it's just i i just don't well, what did DeSantis have at his peak like 28 29 yeah 28 I, i'd have to look i don't have it in front of me but something around yeah. that yeah but i the thought with DeSantis was always that he could unite the tribes you know this is the fundamental issue with the anti-trump right. exactly effort, right. right which is i was actually talking to a guy that's working for a super PAC trying to beat Trump and still a Republican. And, and I was like, T- test me out on this. But I think that the persuadable vote, if you say that Trump has this 35% rock hard base, right? Like to me, the persuadable vote then, the remaining 65, is basically mm-hmm. split down the middle of, of MAGA and Norm, right? Like 30-30. And he was like, eh, it might be a little better than that. It might be, it might be 35-25. And I was like, okay. But still then, then that that puts the peak up at 35. You know, when you're doing the math here, it's like you have to get into the MAGA world somehow. You got to get some percentage of those people. Right. And, you know, maybe Nikki can find some MAGA women who like the fact that she's a woman. She does she does do pretty well in Sarah's focus groups on that stuff. But Trump hasn't really started attacking her yet. I, I think that the, oh, we need the Joe Biden isn't giving enough money to Ukraine. We need to cut spending, cut entitlements. I don't think this is the party for that anymore. Um, th- there's a strong minority of that within the party, but I, I just don't think there's enough people there to do it. Going back to previous primaries, I and mean, we've seen in the Republican primary, you know, a um, strange phenomenon where, you know, Michelle Bachman has her moment, right? Herman Cain surges to the top of the pack. Uh, Newt Gingrich is all hot, you know, after the debate in South Carolina. There was the Rick Santorum moment. And then, of course, these things fade. Vivek strikes me as the kind of guy who's going to burn very, very hot and very bright, but uh, burn out because the, the more scrutiny he gets, the worse it's going to get. And, you know, he, he's going to get a time in the barrel, not just from the media, which is now going to be vetting him aggressively, but from fellow Republicans who thoroughly detest him. So I don't know that he is that his bump is going to be sustainable. I think that it's got a short fuse on it. On the other hand, Nikki Haley, I think, has the potential for more staying power. I mean, she is substantive. I mean, she's been all over the place. You and I, we've all written about her and how disappointing she is. Are you sure people want substantive? Well, that's an interesting question. But at least in terms of if the donor class uh, does, you know, start calling her up, she'll have more staying power. And the more attention she gets, the more people are going to say, okay, you know, this is, you know, a strong woman. This is somebody who is worth listening to. She makes a lot of sense and she's, uh, she's strong and she's gutsy. And here's my other point. It had to occur to some people after Wednesday. Can you imagine what a general election matchup between Joe Biden and Nikki Haley would look like? If you're a Democrat, you cannot be relishing that prospect. And if Democrats see how bad that would be, some Republicans are also going to come around to thinking, well, wait, we could have another Biden-Trump matchup. Or what if we put a youngish woman, who's still very much in her prime, by the way, up against Joe Biden? Yeah. yeah it's kind of a nightmare scenario. I mean, look, I'm, I'm, just, I'm just sort of gaming this thing out. I'm not, sure, I'm not saying sure. that she's going to win because the numbers are the numbers and the Republican Party is the Republican Party. But if I'm a Larry Ellison and I've just burned through all this money for Tim Scott and that's not going anywhere, and I'm thinking, wait, if she was the nominee, what would that look like, Tim? Yeah. I mean, if you're sitting in the Biden White House, what do you think of running against her? So I actually kind of see the other side of this. Mm -hmm. Christian Vanderbrook had a good article for the Bulwark this week about – what exactly is the plan? Like, like even for, for DeSantis, he was talking about this as DeSantis, not Nikki. But, yeah. you know, let's say he eked it out. Let's say that he had, this is yeah, before the right. debate. Let's say he had a great debate and he wins over Trump and the caucuses narrowly. And then, and then in South Carolina, everybody unites behind him and he wins narrowly. And then they kind of split delegates on Super Tuesday. And, you know, he's in the delegate lead slightly. Then what? You know, like, where do they go from here? Have they thought about that? Like, do they think Donald Trump's going to concede to them? Do they yeah. think Donald Trump's going to give the keynote to the Ron DeSantis convention in Milwaukee next summer? And so anyway, that is even more intense for Nikki. I think that there's a huge chunk of the party that would never go for her. Never. And I think you end up with a RFK 
or Vivek style third party candidate if Nikki is the nominee. And maybe not. I don't see people getting in line for her. Like that 35% rock hard Trump base. If you looked at that Dwayne Register poll, I guess it was 28. And I think Iowa's a bad state for him. You know, I'm laughing. I'm uh, in, in Louisiana, my, my new uh, home state. There was a poll that came out that had Trump 75, DeSantis 10 <laughs> recently. And so oh, it's like, where is Nikki getting votes in Louisiana? Like she's not, right? She's just not. Like they don't want her. I thought that was really a good analysis because there's been a lot of magical thinking, like something, something, something happens. And then Trump, you know, graciously concedes, you know, Trump, you know, <laughs> gives the nominating speech at the convention. This will never happen. You know, the, the magical thinking always has to end with and then Trump dies. Right. I mean, there's there's really no other way because he is never going to admit that he lost. He will never graciously lose. He will never go away. But I noticed, Tim that you did dodge my question. Okay, I'm sorry. Okay, because since we're doing the what if, what if, what if, and now, by the way, I totally accept the premise that it's really hard to imagine this, but what would a Joe Biden, Nikki Haley matchup look like in the general election? Yeah. I'm not saying it's going to happen. Sure. See, this is the vulnerability. I think Joe Biden can beat Donald Trump because he's Donald Trump. But what if the meteor strikes? What if the Big Mac takes him out? What if there is a younger candidate? Yeah. If I'm a Democrat, I think the, that matchup just has to be terrifying to them. I guess. So this is my point. Is that I just don't think that we would ever see that for this reason, which is that if Nikki, if Nikki were the likely nominee, I don't think Joe Biden is running again. Right. I think that the Democrats would have had a primary or even Kamala would be the nominee and, and, and we could, you know, game out fantasy politics of what Kamala versus Nikki would look like, but it's different. I, I just, I don't think you're ever seeing a stage where it's Joe Biden and Nikki Haley on that stage. Uh, Cause I think that, you know, there'd be a MAGA third party candidate and or Joe Biden would get out of the way. Right. I, but sure. Yeah. You're right. Like in a, on Earth seven, Earth 7.0. I think that's a huge problem for Democrats. Right. Because Nikki Haley is whatever, 48 or however old she is. And, and Joe Biden, you know, is, is going to look like the past up there. But I think that for a variety of reasons within the Republican Party and within Joe Biden's strategic thinking, there's no path to that. But the Biden re-election campaign does seem to be premised on the assumption that it's going to be Donald Trump at this point. So pretty good assumption. I mean, he's winning by a lot. Well, you know, th this is really the just watching the agony of the anti-anti-Trumpers, you know, who had <laughs> who, you know, are stuck with like, we have to beat Joe Biden, but we can't go along with Donald Trump. And they they projected so many qualities onto Ron DeSantis. There was so much wish casting there. It's really been a struggle for them. They're not going to go along with Vivek, but this realization seems to be sort of settling in on them that the magical thinking, I think, in DeSantis' world and the anti-anti-Trump world was the assumption that these criminal indictments would take care of Trump for them. And so... It is still an amazing moment, even for people within that world, that Republicans look at these perp walks and these mugshots and say, yeah, we're fine with that. We are OK with that. OK, you know, he set baby monkeys on fire. But like, who doesn't? Th their agony takes us back to my very first answer in this question, which is just our slow rolling. I told you so. It's like they hate us so much. And, and for people who don't know, sometimes we just throw out the anti antis People don't know what we're talking about. But um, you know, these are the people that, that really dislike Trump privately, politicians, the, the right wing commentators that dislike Trump privately, but but have just continued to stick with him because the Democrats are bad and the Democrats are scarier and Elon Omar and, uh, you know, transgender youth or whatever the, the excuse of the day is. And they're going to find themselves now for like the ninth, tenth straight year having to suck it up and, you know, just be Donald Trump's, you know what, again, apologist. The thing is, like, they hate us because, like, we are a mirror up to their choices. <laughs> and and they, they would, you know, say they have TDS and they're, they're Democrats now and whatever. But it's like, yeah. had they listened to us in 2015, had they listened to us in 2016, 2017, impeachment one, the 2020 election, the after the stop the steal, impeachment two. They had so many fucking off ramps. They had so many off ramps, and it was so obvious. It wasn't hard to figure out that they were going to end up here. It was so obvious that they were going to end up here, and they refused to take every single off ramp. And now they are stuck on this hell ship with the flaming monkeys and Donald Trump's uh, mugshot. And I just, I don't feel bad for him. I kind of enjoying their pain. I have to admit. Are we going to do the t-shirt? The Come on. We're going to do the t-shirt, right? Yeah. I wish <laughs> we were never Trumpers were right t-shirt, please. Yeah. This is Tim's brilliant idea. 
that you have the mug shot and he said, and what, what does it say? Never Trumpers were right. The bulwark.com. <laughs> There's a slightly more obnoxious way to say, we told you so. Oh, we told you <laughs> we so. Told you so. Sure. We told you so. The bulwark.com. Either of those are acceptable to me. We, we are going to have that t-shirt because I want that t-shirt. Okay, great. Let's do I it. I want to walk down Main Street in Cedarburg with a big mugshot. We told you so. Or, you know, never Trump from the jump. <laughs> Just some version of that. I really want that. Okay. Same. Sorry. So anyway, by the way, because you will sometimes throw yourself on the sword. Did, did you watch any of the Tucker counter-programming with Donald Trump? Uh, this was the one time I have not thrown myself on the sword. Okay. I, I watched a clip show put together by somebody, and that was, that was it. So I, I've seen somebody's highlights. Low since. energy, tired, weird. Yeah. Uh, Philip Bump, though, is debunking some of these you know crazy numbers that are coming out. And basically, look, it turns out one in three likely Republican primary voters watched the debate, which is a pretty big number. One in six watched all of it, all two hours. Only one in 20 watched Trump talk to Tucker instead. So let's just put this in some context. And that may actually be good for Trump because, you know, he's continuing to retcon January 6th, you know, talk about, you know, the riot, the attack on the Capitol, you know, in which you had uh, all of these police officers bloodied and a death toll as this beautiful day, this wonderful picnic of patriotism. And he is all in on all of this. And, of course, we're going to get a lot more of that because he is absolutely committed to making January 6th, his attempted coup, into a great, proud moment in American history. Yeah. And Republicans ought to realize that that's going to be their platform in 2024. And I think that's an interesting stat because I'm genuinely intrigued by the poll not the very first ones, but like maybe two Fridays from now. By two Fridays from now, I think two that we're Fridays. really going to know a lot, you know, because it will have been in the water for a week. And, you know, you got to let this stuff trickle down to the two thirds of people that didn't watch the debate. But these guys had about as good a chance as they're going to have. They had a third of the party watching them without him there at all. Right. Free shots. Mm-hmm. And then he gets a rain the next day. Now, everybody's going to see that. Everybody's going to see the mugshot. It's number four. People are going to be able to you know, judge like whether that's someone that they're going to want to put up. If there is no meaningful gain, what else is left to happen? That would it be a gain for people? I know that the, you know, delusional or rational confidence people will say, maybe when they get to the voting booth, right, <laughs> then they're finally mm-hmm. going to get serious. But that was about as clean a shot as they're going to have. No, no, no. I, you and I have lived through this before, right? Yeah. yeah, no, I'm sorry to bring this back, but I'm sure that you remember back in 2015 at exactly this point, everybody would say, well, there's, you know, five months, uh, no votes have actually been cast and lots of things. It's way too early. In fact, it was already too late. All right. But I do think that it's important to, to uh, provide a little bit of an antidote to the, you know, the more he's indicted, the stronger he gets. Because okay. yes, within the Republican Party, that may be true. But hello, that's still a minority right now because you're getting one poll after another suggesting that this is not helping him, shockingly, in a general election. Um, I'm reading this from Politico. A new political magazine, Ipsos Poll, provides some bad news for Trump. Even as he remains the clear front runner for the Republican nomination, the cascading indictments are likely to take a toll on his general election prospects. Amazingly, we have not repealed all of the laws of political gravity. The survey results suggest that Americans are taking the cases seriously, particularly the 2020 election case, and that most people are skeptical of Trump's claim to be a victim of a legally baseless witch hunt or uh, an attempt to uh, weaponize law enforcement. Public sentiment in certain areas, including how quickly to have a trial and whether to jail Trump, is moving against the president when compared to previous Politico polls. So, Right now, most respondents want a trial before the general election. Most Americans right now, um, Trump is guilty in the eyes of half of Americans. Do you believe that Donald Trump is guilty of the alleged crimes? Total, 51% yes, no, 26%. Hmm. Among independents, 53% yes, he's guilty, only 20% no, and that's before the televised trial. That is before one court date after another. So, you know, once again, even though there are those polls showing him running neck and neck with Joe Biden, uh, guys, how does a year of litigation and arraignments and trials and testimony, how does that help Donald Trump win swing states in a general election? I mean, isn't, isn't that the heart of it right now? 
Yeah. And the front page of the Atlanta Journal Constitution this morning is the mugshot with books. <laughs> you know, I used to work in campaign PR. That's not really what you're generally going for for your candidates is uh, is to be on the front page of the biggest swing state paper with your mugshot. Uh, generally not seen as helpful. You know, think back to the old WDUI controversy right before the 2000 election. But it seems um, so trivial now, So right? trivial. <laughs> um, but, you know, and the other bizarre thing about all this, we did a little gimmick on the Next Level on the next level podcast this week where we were mm-hmm. like, the jail or the White House are, are really the two main options for this person in the next two years is one of the most bizarre yes. dichotomies, I it's think, true. in world history. It's just I was looking at that same poll. I guess it was in your newsletter. It was like 50% of the country wants him jailed. I'm, yes, I'm part of that 50%. Right. Yeah. And it's like it's like 50% of the country wants him jailed. 41% wants him to be the leader of the free world. It is like, it's just, I mean, it's it's kind of hard to wrap your head around. I know it's our job to help people wrap their heads around that, but it's that's a tough one. Yes, it is a dichotomy. And uh, yeah, you're not the uh, crazy ones. Okay, point of personal privilege, Mr. Miller. Please. So I think I've told you this before, but this is actually happening. I'm going to have a teenager in the house again. Congrats, dad. But he wasn't really sure until right before we started this podcast. My grandson, Elliot, who's French, wants to come and live with us and attend school here in Mequon, Wisconsin. There was some paperwork, obviously. Uh, there's there's some, you know, uh, passport stuff. And so um, he and his mom, my daughter, you know, took a train to Paris to go to the U.S. Embassy today. And if, if things were going to go wrong, it was going to go wrong today. He's coming tomorrow. Okay, so don't leave things to the last minute. So at 4.30 this morning, I roll over, you know, hear my phone buzzing. And there is a picture of him. And I put it in my newsletter outside the U.S. Embassy holding his passport. He's got it. And so he is coming. This is actually going to be happening. I'm going to have a teenager in the house for the next semester. I'm a soccer dad. I'm going to be a soccer dad again. I mean, like, man. Football dad, I think. Well, it's soccer here. (laughs) (laughs) A reality check. Can I have a request? I think, um, you know, I don't know anything about your grandson, so feel free to to reject this. But Mm. maybe around Christmas, I want our Friday podcast to end with, I want to interview him. I want like five minutes to, I want to ask him about being a, you know, a Parisian in, in Mequon. Cause I am fascinated by what it would be like to be an eighth grader yeah. who just gets dropped into Mequon, Wisconsin. You know, we could just a little break from the parade of horribles. Um, I, Cause I'm very intrigued by this. Well, that's a deal that I will at least talk to him about and see whether okay. he's comfortable doing that. I mean, I think a podcast is kind of low, no pressure. Low, low, no well, pressure. no, it's, it's low pressure because, I mean, we don't have like cameras around us or anything like that. So, uh, yeah. And it will be fascinating to know because, and again, I am so out of touch with what the culture, the social media culture is. I mean, it is, I, I think it's hard to be in middle school. Was, was your middle school years difficult? My middle school years were fucking awful. Can you imagine going through middle school with social media now? No. I don't want to catastrophize it, but, you know, it's one thing for, you know, people to have clicks and talk about people behind their back. But now, of course, it's so much more difficult, you know, you know, one jerk with it with an Instagram account. And I don't know. It does seem, I have to tell you, the school system has been so responsive and they are so supportive and they're sort of aware of all of the problems. And so, you know, they, they will have a support network to help him. His English is extremely good, but they're going to have people who are going to help him with the, with the English and with math and things because you don't know what you don't know. I'm sorry, Charlie. I've been told that our school system is in complete tatters and disarray. And all, the only thing people care about is critical race theory and they don't actually teach anything anymore. Is that not, does that not seem right? Not in Mequon, Wisconsin. <laughs> I have been reliably informed the same thing. Um, I'll report back, but it doesn't appear to be the case in Mequon, Wisconsin. So you have a great weekend, Tim Miller. And I'll talk to Elliot about this and say that at least put the request in. It may, and again, probably not till the end of the semester. Sounds good. Congratulations. We'll talk to you soon. And congrats on the mugshot. (laughs) Congratulations to all of us for the mugshot. (laughs) To all of Americans, if only they had been warned, if only they had been warned. But Tim, keep pushing for the T-shirt. And if we can get coffee mugs, I'm on it. Mm, that would be pretty cool, too. OK, so use your extensive influence on all of this. I'm and thank it. you all for listening to this weekend's uh, Bulwark podcast. I'm Charlie Sykes. We will be back on Monday and we'll do this all over again. 
Bulwark podcast is produced by Katie Cooper and engineered and edited by Jason Brown.